and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast. Joining me today is Philip Lewis, author of the haunting and superb novel, The Barrowfields. Welcome, Philip. Thanks so much for having me. So you're a litigation lawyer, which uh, is used in the book a little bit, um, it, it, fictionally. And you also used to write an online journal of literary criticism, I read. Uh, tell us more about your background. Yes, I, I am a litigation lawyer. Um, most of what I'm doing right now is um, civil rights litigation. That's that's a bit of a change for me. Um, when I went to law school, well, it seems like years and years ago now, um, it was uh, it was something. It, it was always an aspiration to try to do something to help people and make some kind of difference in the world. And you know, law school has has a way of um, teaching you some some of the realities about the business of practicing law and a lot of folks who go in with those kind of goals and aspirations don't come out with them or they don't hold them very long once you get out because you you have student loans and that sort of thing Mm. and so for a number of years i was doing uh courtroom type stuff um but i wasn't uh wasn't helping people to the extent that i that i really wanted to be and uh but i've i've changed gears fairly recently and uh, i've gone to work for another firm and so part of my part of my job involves um, helping folks that have been wrongfully convicted, mm. uh, which is which is in, just an incredibly uh, inspiring work to see these folks and, and their plights and what their situation is. And uh, we're, we're helping a fellow now who um, was wrongfully convicted in 1976 and spent 43 years uh, behind bars. Um, oh, yeah. For a murder that he did not commit, and uh, he was he was freed ultimately with um, after years and years of hard work by the Duke Innocence Project over here, and uh, and he's a he's a current client of mine, and uh, and so that's that's the sort of work that I'm that I'm doing now. It, but so I, I've always had this duality, I guess, where you know the the practical on the one side and the and the impractical and the creative on the other side. And, and I, I don't know why I try to balance them. It's, it's just about impossible. Um, maybe uh, training from my parents, I guess. But throughout the time that I was practicing law and, and doing the things that I needed to do to make a little bit of money and, and to survive, um, I was, I've always read and written and, and uh, been obsessed with the written word and, you know, I'm sitting now in this room. We're not doing a video conference, of course, but you know, I'm sitting in this room that's full of books, and it's my favorite room in the house, and it, that's just how how I've always been. And there's it. I think that you and I may share some similarities in that regard. <laughs> where, mm-hmm. You know, there's just nothing. There's really nothing better than than just sitting down with a book in your hand and seeing the words on the page, and and hearing the words in your head and and going places that people take you in books. And so, uh, so that, that, that makes up those two halves of my personality, I suppose. Mm. Oh yeah. I I totally agree with you there. Yes. So to move into the novel itself, the Barrowfields is a first person narrative told by Henry. It's the story of his early years and revolves around the moment his father also called Henry left the family And it's about the impact that this has on Henry and his relationship with his sister as he grows up. Now, the book is set in a fictional town in North Carolina, largely in the 1980s and 90s. And it's very gothic and sobering, but there are also moments of great humour. And it reads like a classic American novel. It's full of emotion and heart, and it's really quite moving. So, Philip, I was wondering, where did this book come from? First of all, you're very kind. <laughs> I thank you. I thank you uh, so much for the kind words. Um, the The book was a long time in the making. Uh, it was it was about five years in the writing, and then and then another couple of good solid years of of editing to bring it about. Um, mm. But it, it the, the the book is set in the mountains of North Carolina. And ha, have you been to North Carolina or or to that part of the states? No, I um I haven't been to America at all, um, <laughs> which is a uh, more the pity. But no. Well, we're we're gonna fly you over. I, I think you <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> yes, you should absolutely come visit. Um, it is so North Carolina. It's a you know it's a beautiful state. 
and it has there's a there's a there's a lot of history to it. it you know, from from Wilmington, uh, which is at the coast, um, to the far western and northwestern mountains, and the the northwestern mountains of North Carolina, it's really unlike any other place that I've ever been. Um, there's just the, the the people there are are extraordinary, and you know you're talking about a place where, you know, the elevation is anywhere from three thousand to five thousand feet mm. um, above sea level, and um, and the winters are long and cold, and and you have you have these extraordinary uh, people who are sort of sort of natural storytellers and natural musicians, and they're you can you go up into the mountains and it is dark and it can be gothic and you can walk into an old country store and and have a conversation with anyone in there whether whether you ever met them before or not and within minutes they might be in the midst of telling you some extraordinary story um, about their life or the lives of someone that they know and and they have a, a a lot of there's a, their their dialects, their their ways of manners of speaking up there, which are also unique if, if you know where to look and know where to find them. And so if you're looking for a setting um, where the, unlike any other place, uh, the mountains of North Carolina is just a great place to start. Mm. And in having grown up in the mountains of North Carolina, it 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 can be it can be bleak. there's there's a joke about, um, the weather up there, the the, um, the natives, when, when people come in from out of town and they'll say, you know, in the middle of the summer, it's it's quite nice. And the, and the, and the person visiting might say, well, what's the weather like up here mm-hmm. in the mountains? And the response is usually something along the lines of, well, we have three months of absolutely terrible weather. And then it turns winter. <laughs> and uh, which is not entirely far from the truth. Um, but I think, you know, it, you grow up there, the culture is different. There, there are museums and plays and things like that you're not as likely to see. And, and for a thinking person growing up there in the mountains, um, it, can be, it can be stark and can engender certain emotional responses. And I think that so much of the barrow fields grew out of my emotional and intellectual response to to growing up in in a place like the mountains of North Carolina. Mm. So you've got um, you know, this fictional town, Old Buckram. Was there a reason for using uh, something more fictional? Was it you know related to what you've been saying? Well, you know, I like the idea of of, of an amalgamation of of places. Mm. Uh, the, there's so many extraordinary places. I think in the mountains all along the, the western boundary of North Carolina from Murphy all the way up to Boone and beyond. And in going with a fictional town gave me a little gave me some liberties in regard to how I could create it. And I could I could imbue it with so many of those characteristics that you might find in the in the high western mountains, but not be uh not be limited to what you might actually find on the ground somewhere. And I, you know, and I kind of knew that, um, I knew that uh, people were going to be trying to guess anyway, where the book was set. And I was afraid that if I actually picked the place and set it there, that I would get details wrong and come Mm. and uh, suffer some criticism as a result of the details that I, that I missed. And so, you know, I kind of had this idea, you know, having grown up re- reading Thomas Wolfe and William Faulkner, I, I, I wanted to I wanted to create this place of just pure imagination that could be anything that I wanted it to be. Mm. I was, obviously, yeah, as we said, I, I've not got any uh, personal experience of uh, North Carolina at all. But um, I was actually surprised when I put, you know, I, I put the old Buckram into Google to see. <laughs> what it might look like and I, I was very surprised actually because you know it's written and it comes alive so much but um yeah I think you've explained you know how that's happened so well so in old Buckram you've got Henry's family house uh which he refers to as the vulture house and I know to me it kind of it came across sort of like de Maurier's uh, Mandalay in that it's a character in itself but in a way it was kind of more striking 
and more foreboding even than that house uh and um it was quite hard I found to kind of get an idea in my head of what it looked like uh from the first you know and then then you get used to it uh which almost seemed to be a point in itself I thought I thought it was great um what was your inspiration for the house well to be honest with you I was reading a lot of Edgar Allan Poe at the time that the house was born (laughs) right and and so the the house on the page began as something more like uh, Ernest Hemingway's house, maybe in in Key West, Florida. You know, it was I think it was white even, and and had these enormous porches, and it, it was set up on the side of a mountain, and uh, it, it was um, there was there was a dark aspect to it, but but it it just simply it, it didn't achieve the um, it didn't have that aspect of chronic malaise. That, that I think um, the Vulture House really needed. And so with successive drafts, it just became darker and and uh, and sort of more sprawling. And I found myself with, you know, I had this kind of odd sort of obsession with it. And I and, and, and in writing those scenes, I wasn't really enjoying being there. And mm-hmm. so I went out and in order to envision it better, I had graph paper and I drew it all out and, and um, plotted it and I never actually had somebody do it on AutoCAD or something like that but I thought about it um, but it just it just kind of grew in the telling and as you say it became more and more of its own sort of character and I would find myself just spending lots and lots of time in the house and writing scenes and and, and writing rooms even in and, and generating history for the house that didn't actually make it into the book because I was, you know, I, I felt that it was necessary to understand the whole history of the house and everything that had gone on there and and in its entire personality and this this uh, this strange sort of darkness that it embodied and and carried, which was sort of terrifying to everyone else, but was so attractive in some strange way to Henry the Elder. Mm. So I, I think that for the most part, it was just uh, um, it was just a creature of imagination that just kind of suited. It met the darkness of the novel and the, perhaps the darkness of the mood that I had when I was when I was when I was creating it. Mm. That uh, yeah, when I was uh, reading it, I kind of I, I mean I I don't know if you know the the computer game The Sims. Yes. I kind of yeah yeah I kind of wanted to get the sims up I, you know I do do play a lot and kind of plot the house out so you saying about the graph paper you know that that kind of um kind of I suppose I could re- you can read that into the story that may you know the amount of detail you've put into it um and I, I don't think anyone's going to moan at me uh keeping on the house for a moment because uh, I was wondering about the library um it's it's the room is, I suppose, relatively neutral compared to the rest of the house. And I mean, it, you know, it gets my vote in the house because it's a library. Um, did you have any particular library in mind or any picture when you um, imagined it? You know, I didn't. Um, I, but I, but I love, I love libraries. And at some point, I, I think I went online and I was, I was trying to find. Um, pictures of things that were sort of similar, and I, and I, and I found, you know, I came across some some uh, places which had some some pretty cool aspects. But I, you know, I just I loved the idea of this place where there are unlimited unlimited books with the it had the big aperture, I guess, in the floor, and then another aperture in the ceiling where you could you could you know it, it literally was right that the the heart of the whole house wasn't it and. Mm-hmm. You could you could stand at the railing and look down into the great room below where the piano was, and you could look up and through another enormous uh, hole in the ceiling and see to the glass and iron of the of the roof. And it was you know in that in the house that I grew up in, we had we had a, a small little I, I call it a library, but it was not a library. It was just like it was a bunch of bookshelves, and we had books upstairs. And we had another place like that downstairs, and those were and those were my two favorite places. And you know, if I could if if I could die and go to heaven, it would I would wind up in a library like existed in the Vulture House, with you could walk around in their shelves that are twelve feet high, and 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 then off in the in the corner is 
is the writing room. And I think all of us, I think everybody who writes, who does anything creative sort of longs for that kind of space mm. where you can be surrounded by your inspiration entirely and yet simultaneously have a place where you can go to, to focus on the work that you're trying to do. And so it, it, it was, you know, it was kind of a place that I would go to in my imagination when I was writing. And I always felt like I understood Henry's character walking into this, this, you know, I think he calls it a, a gothic uh, skeleton of a house and, and finding this library and seeing it. And, and, and I think to the average person, it, it would be something where they would be inclined to say, you know, this is creepy and it's not for me. But I think mm -hmm. there's so many of us who would walk in and say, like Henry did, oh, here I can write. And that's what I was imagining. Mm. Yeah, it's it's the um, just the uh, I suppose the highlight of the house when the rest of it seems very dark. Uh, just right. some some somehow it's um, it's difficult to find the darkness in it at the same time. I suppose. Do we have a reading? Oh yes, um, I would be absolutely delighted if you would if you would indulge me. So I was thinking about you know there's a fair amount of music in the book. And um, the passage that I was going to read here, and it's a very short passage, but it's it's a scene where um, Story and comes into young Henry's house. And Story, I guess we should say, is um, a, a, a very bright young lady and a very strong young lady who um, our, our narrator, protagonist Henry, falls for and, and, and has a deep abiding love and attraction to and and he he's he tries throughout the book to understand her and i think to some extent she tries to understand him and 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 while she's well she's anywhere other than with him he's thinking about her and he plays the piano and he he's this isolated kind of character and he, he sits at the piano and he plays the chopin and and beethoven and Liszt and so forth all the while imagining that maybe one day she would come up on his porch and stand outside his screen door and hear him playing and hear all the passion in it and know that that he was playing for her and so the here the moment in the book here is when she's finally she's finally arrived and she comes into his little house his modest house and they walk into the living room where he has the piano and he all at once gets to sit down and play and he experiences this extraordinary outpouring of emotion all everything every time that he's ever sat and played imagining that she could hear the music for uh being played for her well here she is and um so that's uh that's that's where i'll start if that's okay mm. and i'll put my glasses on it's um I got some, I, I sent off for some glasses today and, um, or yesterday and they arrived today by miracle of Amazon. And, um, I'd misjudged the size, um, the reading glasses and I look a lot like Milton Berle with them on. So again, it's good that we don't have the video running. This podcast is not sponsored by Amazon. I'm just going to note <laughs> for anyone listening. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Um, I told her I had no idea where he was. I said, I was 16 the last time I saw him. She thought about this a long time and chewed on her lip like she wanted to say something more, but I changed the subject as I always did and started time going again. She wandered then into the next room where she stopped at the piano and touched the books of music stacked there in disarray. I always wanted to play, she said. One day I will. And then she asked, will you play something for me? The room was small and the uneven floor held only the piano, a couch and an old chair. The piano stood against an inside wall. I sat down to play and Story stood behind me, next to me, watching. I could hear her breathing. I opened the book of music and then closed it again. I could read it without seeing it. I played the fantasy impromptu, Chopin's posthumous opus 66, 
the one I always played, thinking she might happen to come by my door and hear the music and know it was for her. Allegro agitato. Begin. An octave in the left hand struck like a bell, a foreshadowing. Then, dark arpeggios, again in the left hand, an approaching cannonade. Fiercely ascending runs in the right, intricate, delicate, unrelenting, a sense of acceleration tempered by a cascading retreat. And we begin again. Breathe, surge, dissipate, surge, pedal, pedal, pedal. This cut time rhythm pushes you along. After only a minute, we are brought up short by a crashing left hand cadence. And it is here that a sweet, simple melody ensues pianissimo that has no parallel in modern music to my knowledge. This perfect melody was, in my bursting heart, the song of story. With exquisite fleeting variations, it lingers, frolics, demurely relents, and is gone. The light of a single day. At once, the surging silver cannonade returns, and the melody, now hidden in faint to the ear's remembrance, becomes almost forgotten. At the end of this magnificent tumult, when the piece is drawing to a close and fading into silence, the sweet, perfect melody appears once more, this time in the left hand alone, this time only once. So on that subject of music, because, uh, you know, it, it's one of the best parts of the book, I think, um, there's a lot, lot of culture in the novel. There's obviously it's a book about books, which we'll talk about in a minute. There's also uh, time spent looking at the stars and the planets. Uh, there's a hint of philosophy and uh, law. But I think most apparent, perhaps, is the use of classical music. And yes, I personally loved it. You know, I'm, I'm really into classical music. Um, and there's a point where Henry's father is discussing Chopin. And I went and got YouTube up and I had listened to it because it was one I hadn't heard before. The A minor mazurka, opus 17, number four, for anyone yes. who wants to look for it. Um, and I noticed that not only did it align with what narrator Henry had been mentioning previously, I think he had said... Uh, can't remember the exact wording, but uh, the music started slowly and then it was um, quite invigorating to play. And it, it kind of I was I was listening to it while I was reading uh, some of the pages and it kind of corresponded to the structure of the book, I found, um, which was wonderful. And I just wondered how important was music as a, as a general part of the of the book compared to the other aspects for you? Well, music was perhaps. Um second in importance only to uh, the books. Mm. And, you know, I, I've always wondered what it, what life would be like if we didn't have music, if we didn't have Chopin, for example. Um, it's kind of hard to imagine when you think about it. Uh, and life is, music is such such an important part of my life and it informs everything that I do and, and it seems to go hand in hand with emotion. I think. Mm. I think it's hard to it's hard to have emotion in in the absence of some kind of connection to music. And I think so many emotions are tied to some music, maybe that we were listening to at the time, or some some quality in 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 some piece that that we know or or can relate to. And uh, so much of the book was written with with music in, in the background. And I, I kind of mean that sort of literally and figuratively that I, I would, you know, for example, they would, the, the, um, a minor mazurka, um, which is an extraordinary piece. And it, it's almost, it's really more like a nocturne. I think the, the, the Polish dance aspect, I think the name of the piece derives from, and I have no basis for saying this, but there's there's a little bit of a dance section in the in the middle of the piece, mm -hmm. which is lovely. But the heart of the piece is this um, uh, a, a nocturne type uh, arpeggios over over a waltz pattern, and I think it can be played brightly, but it, it can also be played quite um, 
with a, with a, quite a bit of melancholy. And, and sometimes what I would do is when I was searching for a certain level of emotion for a particular scene, I would identify some music that took me to that place and I would, I would play it and, and, and search for, search for a way to articulate the emotion that I heard in the particular piece or the particular pieces. And of course it was tempting to, to, to take structure from the world of music and put it into the novel. And, you know, the four part um, structure of the book was initially conceived as something, uh, something akin to something symphonic with different movements and different variations on themes. And so, you know, broadly speaking, it, music really is um, a very core part of the book. Mm. Yeah, it, it's, it's nice that there's so many pieces in there to uh, go back to and listen to. I think I kind of, I kind of wish I'd made a list and uh, I could go back and listen to all the ones that I don't know. Um, but no, yes, yeah, so that then that's a that's a recommendation for anyone who uh, is listening and would like to read the book. Uh, do have a notepad with you because there is a lot of music that you're going to want to listen to, and there are a lot of books that you're going to want to note down and either reference or just just uh, note for further reading and on that subject from the outset the novel shows itself to be a book about books uh henry henry's father's a writer he passes his love of books to his children as we've heard so there are literary references aplenty and they're a joint joy to find um philip how does the literature in the book relate to your own interests um and how much is uh just henry's well, oh i have to say that 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 Part of it is um, ha- has a a one to one correspondence to exactly how I feel about mm. books and literature, and 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 what one thing I love about um, about books and literature uh, is, is when I find literary references in in a text, like honest to goodness ones. And I know there's a debate about this. I know that there are a lot of writers who say that. You know they don't do this intentionally, and and uh, and critics and readers um, overlay symbolism and 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 unintended meanings on text and that sort of thing. But I also know that there's a there's a very rich history of of literary reference that is is as old as the written word, and and uh, and and I and I tend to love that, and I love when a an author indicates to me right off the bat that there's going to be a depth, a complexity to the text where I could take it at face value or I could look a little deeper and mm-hmm. look at word etymologies and and place names and names of people and and in and, and certain flourishes and, and be able to tie those into something beyond the text which itself has meaning. And and, and I oh I just love that dearly. And so that was an enormous amount of fun to do with the Barrow Fields was to take all the literature that had made such an impression on me and was so important in my life from, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald to Emily Dickinson to Herman Melville. I mean, you name it. I mean, it, everything that I'd read in high school and since high school that just left me astonished and in awe um, and, and to be able to tip my hat and pay homage and, and, and to, to those things to J.R.R. Tolkien and um, I mean just it, the list goes on and um, and that that was an enormous amount of fun to me but it also you know I really found that it it is an effective way to communicate you know a much greater idea there's mm-hmm. a scene for example and this is just one but there's there's a scene where uh, Story and Henry have have returned to the vulture house and 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 it's the 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 day is falling and the 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 darkness is coming into the house and they're making the most of it and trying to see the brightness in the shadows and i think there's a line that 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 uh that references um an f scott fitzgerald um it's an f scott fitzgerald reference that um it pertains to a Tennessee Williams play about Scott and Zelda 
that it's funny. It's, it seems like few people know about it, um, but it's called Clothes for a Summer Hotel. And I don't know that it's a particularly um, good play um, by Tennessee Williams. It's certainly dark and it's, and, it, and it's quite serious. And so there's a reference to the Clothes for the Summer Hotel in that particular passage. And it's, and it's this light and lively passage, but the idea was to communicate this underlying darkness and a foreboding uh, within the scene. And by, by tying in the Tennessee Williams there at that particular point, um, I, I, I tried to give it that foreboding. And that's just, that is an example. And I don't know if that sort of thing works, but as a, as a reader, um, I, I love to look for things like that and find them in, in text. Mm. No, I, I saw the Scott and Zelda, but uh, now you said the play. No, I, I did miss that one myself. Um, but I, I know that the first time when I, I read your novel first time, you know, a couple of years ago and coming back to it, uh, it just kind of reminded me how important I think, I think especially with books that are about books, uh, it is important to come back and uh, even if it's just browsing through them uh, a few years later or whenever you can do it, because you you obviously, you know, you're reading more all the time and you realise more. I mean, I know uh, I, I, I'd already read To Kill a Mockingbird um, before I read The Barrowfields, but I completely missed the reference to uh, to Scout and Arthur Radley. Oh, <laughs> oh goodness, you know. Um, did you ever worry uh, that, like a, a significant amount would be missed or did you did you just go ahead and add what you wanted and you know what will be will be kind of thing I assumed that most people wouldn't be looking for it mm. would, would not be looking for the references and would probably would probably read over them the first time and I think we all have that tendency I, I think it it's perfectly ordinary for a reader to, when you, when you first pick up a book, it's almost like getting to know somebody for the first time in your first conversation with them. And you're willing to give them maybe a certain benefit of the doubt, but you're not going to assume necessarily um, that they have an enormous depth of character, say. And I think we all are a little, we tend to be standoffish at first when we encounter people and we encounter new books, perhaps. And uh, at least, at least I do that, and I, and I want to believe that the that the writer is going to take me on some extraordinary journey, and show me all that depth. But mm -hmm. I I think, and I've and I've certainly done this so many times where I've read a book and then learned later on that it had so much more than I than I saw in it the first time, and I I went had to go back and and really dive in the second time, and I think that's that's normal and natural and. Um, and so I assumed that that's what would happen, but I was hopeful that with a few hints and indications here and there that people would read the text closely and deeply and start to look for those Easter eggs and that those different layers of meaning and be rewarded for the search. Mm. It, it is. Uh, yeah, the, you, you say that. That's kind of what I did a, a few days ago. I had, a, I think, a, a chapter and, you know, that's ch showing my lack of uh, knowledge here. It got to Blanche Dubois and I was like, oh, who's that? You know, so I had to put that in. And uh, then I kind of went, oh, my goodness, you know, I really should know that. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's definitely something that um, your book inspires so I've been trying to uh, keep away, I suppose, from some of the story because you don't want to spoil the story. But um, I wanted to touch, if we can, on the mystery of where Henry's father went, because early on we know that Henry's father has left the family, but you you don't know why. You know, there's a, there's a few possibilities. Um, and so the mystery is in, introduced in the prologue and then uh, that prologue is repeated with an addition in uh, later on in the novel. So was leaving the mystery of what happened to Henry Senior uh, always the plan, Philip? It, it wasn't. Mm. But I will tell you that, that, yeah, I think sometimes when you when, when you write over a period of time and you're working on something that's that's something very true and dear to yourself and your own emotional life. 
real life, I think, has a way of creeping into the narrative sometimes. And at the time that I was writing this this book, um, I was having a difficult time um, addressing some issues that my father was having. He is, and 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 I, and, and I don't think he'd mind me sharing because it's something that we try to talk about. Um, he he is always he's been afflicted for many many years with depression, mm -hmm. um, compounded by alcoholism, and and I think that as as I was writing, his condition seemed to be worsening and worsening over a period of months, and almost on an accelerated pace, and. Um, I think that some of the narrative with respect to the elder uh, Henry um, leaving, disappearing from the family, was related to uh, perhaps anticipation that that I that I was experiencing uh, regarding my own father, and perhaps even peremptorily um, experiencing a sense of loss. For what I felt like may be may be coming in my own life, mm. and those that experience uh, found its way into the narrative as the book was being written. Mm. That's um, yeah. Didn't um, mean to take, didn't mean to take <laughs> take it on a turn for the uh, for the more serious there. Sorry about that. No, no, um, it's, it's uh. I so it's not. It's 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 nice uh, as as much as that word can be used to hear the story. Um, do we have one more reading from the Barryfields? Yes, I would. I would love to do that. This is um, this is a scene that I mentioned just a few minutes ago, when um, Story and uh, and Henry have come back to the Vulture House as we were talking about. Mm. And and they've come in, and of course Henry has a dog, a an enormous uh, leonine animal named Buller, who is indefatigable, and only wants to do one thing, which is to chase tennis balls. And so they to set this up, they've they've come back in to the vulture house, and they they've had a traumatic sequence of events that have uh, led up to this moment. And um, Henry thus far has been, un been unable to uh, articulate his feelings for story. And he, he wants to feel close to her and be close to her. Um, but thus far, she has, um, she, she has some uh, emotional uh, matters that she's addressing with respect to her own father and her own life. And so here we are. And they've, they've come back now and they've come, they're coming into the house um, as evening is beginning to fall. At length, Buller wore himself out chasing the tennis ball and we went inside so I could change out of my work clothes. We were both feeling better now that we had talked and I was awash in a complex overlay of aching desire and childlike excitement about the coming evening. We had planned to get dinner out somewhere and then head back up into the mountains to explore and look at the stars. On our way into the house, Story went to the bar in the great room and said, I'll make us a drink. She was getting a little more used to the house or making a good show of it. Light was coming in from the deepening blue of the sky, and I went to the front of the house and propped open all the immense windows and the elaborately mechanical shutters to let in the cool summer air. Your choices are vodka and red wine, I said. There might be something else behind the bar, but I only know of the vodka and the wine. Do we have any tonic? Called Story. We do have tonic, I yelled back. Waiter, vodka tonics all around. Coming right up. We sat at the bar together, dangling our legs as all the sweet and fragrant sounds of summer washed inside. As the light faded, a sadness began to gather overhead and in the corners of the room. What this scene needs, said Story, is some music. 
I was lost in her. I was enraptured by every line and every curve. The subtle shadows nesting in the hollows behind her collarbones. The wondrous lines of her long, exquisite neck. One sweet, meandering spiral of blonde hair from her forehead down over her cheek. My eyes traced a constellation of freckles on her brown shoulder. Watched half moons rising in her unpainted fingernails. She looked at me with such mournful sadness. I wiped away a cobweb from the phonograph, set back into the wall and pulled out a few boxes of records that I hadn't played in years. We started with the ink spots and listened to If I Didn't Care three times in a row. Story then found a collection of waltzes from Strauss to Shostakovich. And we were up dancing and the great room became a magnificent hall as I turned story about and we promenaded at times comically from one end of the gilded space to the other. After two dances, we grew weary of our improvisations and stopped to make another drink. While I searched for more music, Story toured the room as if it were a museum, moving with balletic delicacy from antiquity to antiquity. I played the Larghetto from Mozart's B-flat piano concerto and we danced again, slowly. Story's radiant head was on my shoulder. When the Larghetto reached its quiet conclusion, I replaced it with an album of Chopin's Nocturnes and let it fill the house. Holding hands, we made our way up to my room to change for dinner. My old bedroom had an austere drawing room adjoining it that sat partially underneath the climbing, shadowed staircase to the third floor. It had wide slatted wooden floors and wooden walls that were adorned with nothing. At one end of the small drawing room was a wide cushioned bench with a seat of red fabric. Our bags of clothes were there on the floor Despite the length of my stay, I had yet to unpack. The room had no windows. I lit candles to keep us company. This is actually now the second time that I've wondered if you can see my prompt sheet. Um, because my next question is, um, so I've, I've left this question until last, uh, because I suppose to, uh, objectively, he's not quite as important as the other characters, but he is entirely winsome. Where did Buller the dog first fit into the story for you? <laughs> well, Buller is um, is true uh, biographical material with respect to the Barrow Fields. He may be the only true one. Um, when I was... In law school, I had a dog named Buller, and he was my, my, it sounds like this absurd cliche, but truly my best friend. And he, you know, we lived together and he slept in the bed with me and went everywhere with me. And on days when it was cool enough for him to be in the car, he would ride to school with me and wait on me and then and then go home and we were just joined at the hip um, Mm. for years and years and we just had that connection like I guess you can have with um, with your dog and um, he died unexpectedly um, several years ago and um, he had, you, we, you know, we took him into the vet one night and the next night he was gone. Mm-hmm. And I've never grieved uh, like that in, in, in my life before or since. And, and I still miss him so very, very much. And it, it was just something that meant so much to me to memorialize him in the barrow fields and bring him back to life and put him on the page. And it, it, it just, it, it, uh, I think about him every day and, um, and seeing his name on the page, uh, it makes me so happy and, and, uh, I know it would make him happy too. That's a lovely story. Yeah. Um, 
I, I figured you probably had a dog or um, had had one uh, because it's he, he's so alive in the book. Um, no, I, I can relate to what you say as well. I, ha- I had a, a cat for quite a while. So, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Um, what is next uh, in terms of your writing? Well, I've got um, I've got a fiction project that I'm working on now. And uh, it may be a couple more years in the making, but um, it is um, something completely different than the Barrow Fields. Um, but I, but I believe it has the same, the same level of heart and the same level of soul, and it, it, it comes from an honest place. And 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 I'm trying to write authentically and and sincerely, which that it, I believe that's just such an important thing to do. And and so. And and I I'm not giving out titles yet or even working titles. I I I've, I always I find that um, telling people what your anticipated title is ahead of time is kind of like telling people the name of what you're that you're thinking for your children that haven't been born yet. Mm-hmm. You know you you you'll say yes we're thinking about you know Herman if it's a boy and people will uh, <laughs> will be very visibly taken aback. And they will usually not hesitate to tell you that they think it's a terrible idea. But if you wait until the child is born and then you say, this is Herman, it's all smiles. You know, no Mm. one will ever tell you then that Herman is a terrible name for a child. And I don't have a Herman. I I just threw that out of there. (laughs) Um, And so sort of the same thing with the new book. Um, I'm just keeping the cards very close to the vest and and not really talking about it with anyone. But it's it's coming along and hopefully it will see the light of day sometime in the next two to three years Mm, well that that's the most important thing that you know it's 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 on its way um i think yeah we we will wait patiently (laughs) (laughs) philip it's been wonderful having you here and talking about the barrowfields yeah it's it and it's been lovely to reread it i it it's kind of an investment i think getting the book because you do get so much out of it and then you're going to get more out of it again and again and again it's out now from scepter and links will be in the description to this podcast philip thank you very much for joining me thank you so much for having me it's been an absolute pleasure join me at the earlier time of saturday the 21st of december when i will be talking to samantha soto author of before ever after love and gravity and a dream of trees The Wormhole Podcast Episode 4 was recorded on the 5th of November and published on the 9th of December 2019. Music and production by Charlie Place.